Welcome to Friendly Words, the sermon podcast of Pratt Friends Church in Pratt, Kansas. The message you're about to hear was originally preached at Pratt Friends Church on Sunday, April 24th, 2022. It focuses on the relationship between Nathan the prophet and King David. The message to all who will listen is living by the Spirit, we can help each other follow God, encouraging good deeds and gently correcting wrong actions. Now, here is Pastor Mike Neifert. All right, well, we're going to do something a little bit different. We've been going through the Gospels, and we're going to jump into the Old Testament for a few weeks. And so let's pray together and honor God as we prepare to hear his word. God, thank you that you are with us, and we pray for your word to accomplish in each of our hearts and our minds exactly what it is that you desire to accomplish. We thank you that your word always does that, and that your spirit is here to interpret your word to us, to help us to understand it, and to help us to see what you have for us to be obedient about. And I pray, God, that as we look at the life of one of your prophets today, that we would see how we can serve you in a similar way and how we can be responsive to what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So I had a friend in middle school or maybe high school, I don't know, it might have been both, I don't remember all the details, but for today, to protect his identity, I'm going to call him Cal mostly because we were living in California at the time. I don't remember how I met Cal, so I won't tell you how we ended up hanging out. I just know that for a season we did a lot of things together. Now, Cal had a wildly curly mess of long, sandy blonde hair on top of his head. His life was a bit like his hair, wild and messy. To be fair, at that time of life, for all of us, life's a little bit wild and messy, right? So Cal rode around town on a BMX bike like all the cool kids of that day did, and I rode a 10-speed. Not as cool, but it got me where I wanted to go. For some reason, and I absolutely do not remember the context at all, Cal decided he wanted to stop cussing. So he enlisted my help. He asked me to hit him on the arm every time a bad word slipped out of his mouth. I suppose he thought that the pain would act as a deterrent, but as most of you know, that kind of activity is probably going to increase your cussing and not reduce it. Anyway, you want to know whether it worked or not, don't you? It didn't. I think I punched him once, maybe twice, and I don't think he stopped swearing for very long. But that's what friends are for, right? To punch each other in the arms when you're trying to break a habit. And that, my friends, is all I can tell you about my friendship with Cal. Our family moved away from where Cal lived, and I no longer held sway in his life, and I can only hope and pray that he found Jesus and put his faith in him. Any of you ever had an influence on someone big or small, even if it was just for a short time? Do you even today have pull in a friend's life? How are you impacting those around you? I believe each and every believer can, with the Holy Spirit's help, affect the lives of those with whom they rub shoulders, wherever they happen to be. God can work through you to bring people that you know and love into the kingdom of God, and he can work through you to help others follow him. So in Old Testament times, before the Spirit of God was poured out more liberally on God's people, there was this group of people whom God used to move the hearts of his people and their kings to follow after him, or at the very least to inform them of God's displeasure with their current behavior. These prophets, as they were called, feature largely in the history of God's people. If you grew up in the church, you likely know a few of the names of the prophets of old. Perhaps you've heard of Isaiah or Ezekiel, or Malachi, the Italian prophet. Oh, it's Malachi, sorry. Even if you don't have such an upbringing, there are a few famous prophets whom perhaps you have heard of. Elijah, Jonah, you remember the big fish, Daniel. Maybe those names ring a bell. Whether they do or not, whether you're familiar with these names or not, know that these men had a huge impact in the lives of those to whom they were sent. 
As they spoke God's message freely and clearly, nations were changed or condemned, kings repented or were judged. The stories I read of the exploits of these bold, brave truth speakers probably had the biggest impact on my life growing up. They continue to instruct me and inform me. I want to be as faithful as Jeremiah was and as fearless as Elisha. So over the next five or six weeks, I'm going to introduce you to an Old Testament prophet and talk about how these ordinary enough people, led by God, obediently went to and spoke to a variety of people about what God desired. The first on our list of prophets is a man named Nathan. Anyone ever heard of Nathan before? Okay. If you have, perhaps you know that most of his work was done during David's reign over a united Israel. He often met with the king, conveying truth when it was wanted, and on at least one occasion when it wasn't wanted. So, Nathan first appears in the narrative in the book of 2 Samuel, and he's not there from the beginning. He doesn't show up until chapter 7. It's there that he bursts onto the scene with absolutely no introduction. So let me set the scene for his initial appearance. David is the king. He is all over the opening pages of 2 Samuel. In the first five chapters, we see David made king over Judah. Almost immediately after Saul's death in battle, we witness a war between his house and Saul's house. We watch as the conflict comes to a close, and David takes leadership of all 12 tribes. We see David and his armies defeat their enemies putting them in their place. Then in chapter 6, David, having taken the city of Jerusalem from the Jebusites, starts to bring the ark of God into the city, but there's this mishap on the way, and the ark is left outside the city limits for quite some time. Eventually, David, with singing and dancing and sacrifices and praises and all that, brings this symbol of God's presence into Jerusalem and places it inside a tent that he's set up for worship. This is the context into which we now step in chapter 7. The chapter where, in verse 2, Nathan's name is first mentioned. I'll read the first three verses of the chapter, and you can follow along. So here's what it says. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 to 3, after the king, and it's talking about David here. After the king was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, He said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am living in a house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. Now, I have a lot of questions. Maybe you do too. Where in the world did Nathan come from? Was he among the men who lived in the desert with David as Saul was chasing him around? Is he a a rival against Saul as well? How did he gain influence in the king's court? How long had David known him? When did God start speaking through him? What evidence was there that he was God's messenger? We don't get the answers to any of that. He just shows up and says some things to David. There is, of course, no way for us to know any of these things. These details are lost forever, buried deep in antiquity. Still, I am legitimately curious about this man. All you and I can know is what we have in God's word, and there's plenty of interesting things to look at. So look at the story of the man's first interaction with King David. David speaks out loud his concern over a lack of a more permanent place of worship. He looks at his luxurious palace and the tent which houses the ark of God. The king sees, and he says, this is not right, noting the disparity between the two dwelling places. Nathan, who's either listening in passively or taking part in the conversation actively, we don't know, he speaks up, whatever you have in mind to do, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. This seems to be a prophetic word. Nathan encourages David to pursue the plans in his heart. He even says, the Lord is with you. I find myself thinking, this is the kind of pastor I want to be. I want to urge each of you to do whatever it is that you believe God is telling you to do. It's also the kind of friend that I want to be. And I add this because sometimes uh, we get this, this sense that uh, unless you're up front as a pastor, you don't have anything to do. But now you have a great opportunity as a friend uh, to encourage another 
in following God. And there seems to be a bit of a friendship between David and Nathan. They seem to like each other, to get along. They keep each other accountable as they seek to follow God. So this is the opening scene in the Nathan and David story, and it reminds me of this passage in Hebrews chapter 10. A little over halfway through the chapter, in verses 23 to 25, the writer of Hebrews urges this kind of urging godly action relationship between believers. So listen to what's said by the writer of Hebrews. Again, this is Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25. Writing to the church, he says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The meeting together isn't just about Sunday morning, by the way. It seems to me that the writer is encouraging regular meetups between believing friends. He wants brothers and sisters in Christ to be out and about doing God's will together, urging each other to take the risk of trying things which God might desire them to do. It's almost like saying to your closest friend, let's try it and see what God does. You have a friend like this? A friend who urges you to pursue God's will? Are you a friend like this? If not, ask God to help you to grow in this area for the sake of his kingdom. Interestingly, what Nathan says here isn't exactly what God wants. We need to read a bit more to see that. So let's start at verse 4. We're back in 2 Samuel chapter 7. So we're going to start at verse 4 and read on through verse 7. But that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of the rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? This is no questions asked from God, right? Nathan has gone from generally encouraging David to pursue God's will, assuring him that the Lord is with him, to specifically passing along God's direction to the king. This is what the Lord says. These are the most important words in the passage. They add weight to what follows. What does God say to David about his desire to build this magnificent temple? He basically says, I don't need a house. He implies having a more permanent structure would tie him to a place, would make it seem like he wasn't wherever his people were. Obviously, God can't be located in any one place. He is in all places, at all times, all at once. He's here in this church and in China with his church and in Brazil with his church and in Ukraine with his church. He moves among his people. He moves with you wherever you go. He's He's everywhere and with his people at all times. Speaking to the people at Athens, Paul said something vital to our understanding of God. Listen to what he says in Acts chapter 17, verses 24 and 25. The people of Paul's day needed to hear this truth. We need to hear it as well. So pay attention. Here's what we have in Acts chapter 17, verses 24 and 25. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. Buildings are nothing more than places for God's people to meet. A place for us to meet and spur one another on toward love and good deeds. God does not live in this building. Like when you go home, he doesn't stay here. He goes with you, right? He does not live in this building or in any other church building. He lives in those who believe. He is active in the world through his spirit and through his spirit-filled people, both individually wherever you go and as, as we go together to places, as a church. That's where God lives. 
Nathan has been our example in two ways so far. He's spoken in general terms to encourage David to follow God as best he knows how, and he's followed up with more specific revelation from God. He's conveyed God's not you but another message concerning the building of the temple. If that's all that God had to say through Nathan, I think it would be enough, but there's more which God wants this man to convey to the king. That's what I want us to look at now. So skipping down to verse 11, let's read a bit more of the chapter that we're in. This is what we have in 2 Samuel 7, 11 through 16. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself, this is Nathan speaking to David, that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. This is such a crazy moment. God has something to say about the future of David's royal line. He says through Nathan, it will last forever. That is, last I checked, a very, 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 very long time. Forever doesn't end. It goes on and on and on and on. Keeping all of this in mind, think for a second what hearing these words must have been like for David. This is an absolutely stunning revelation. Listen to the king's words immediately after Nathan tells him this bit of good news. His reply is found in verses 18 and 19. Hear what he says as he responds to God's word to him. 2 Samuel 7, 18 and 19. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, sovereign Lord, and what is my family that you have brought me thus far? And as if this were not enough in your sight, sovereign Lord, you have also spoken about the future of the house of your servant. And this decree, sovereign Lord, is for a mere human. There's more to this prayer than that, but let these words convey the gist of the whole. David is amazed, he's overwhelmed, he's flabbergasted that God would choose him as king and then promise a bright future for his family. This is more than his brain can comprehend. Mind blown. But let me remind you, our focus is on Nathan today, not on David. Nathan is the one through whom God has given this message of hope. If David feels humbled by receiving this word, how much more humbled must Nathan be? Why would God use me to speak this awesome message? (laughs) This is how I feel every time that I pause to contemplate what I do on a regular basis. Why in the world would God pick me? I don't say this rebelliously. I'm not Moses saying, send somebody else to Egypt. My question, rather, comes from deep in my heart. I am filled with amazement and perhaps more than a little puzzlement. I'm nothing special. Why gift me to preach? All I can say to each and every believer listening right now is this. Do what God gives you to do. He has given it to you to do because he wants you to do it. I was reminded of this during one of my devotional times this past week. As part of my time with God, I listen daily to the 10-minute Bible hour. I know that doesn't work in your mind, but that's all right. And Thursday, the show's host brought up the issue of salvation by faith versus salvation by works and referred his listeners to Ephesians chapter 2, a passage that I often refer to. Since I was poised to finish up this section of my message that very morning, I immediately saw the connection with what's going on with Nathan and, by extension, with all of us. So listen to what Paul says to the church in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So the answer to the why me question is simple enough. I'm who I am, 
and I'm doing what I do because God created me to be me and to do this thing that he gave me to do. Mine is to do what I've been given to do. Yours is to do what you've been given to do. I want us to move on now. We have to see how David and Nathan interact in chapter 12 to get a full picture of why God made Nathan a prophet and connected him with David. There's more to a godly relationship than just encouraging good deeds. Much more to it than just this. Before we read anything from chapter 12, we need to note what happens in chapter 11. It's in this chapter that David encounters a woman named Bathsheba. Does that name mean anything to any of you? Her part in David's story is pretty well known. So it's likely at least, at least a few of you have heard of her. Bathsheba was this woman with whom David, in a moment of weakness, committed adultery. This one-night stand ended up with her pregnant. David tried to cover up his sin by bringing Bathsheba's husband home from the battlefront to sleep with her. His plan failed, so David had the man killed. Can you imagine a worse scenario? Sin piled upon sin upon sin. The punishment for both the king's acts was, according to the law of the land, death. The king had reason to cover up his indiscretion. Now, thinking he's successfully hidden his dastardly deeds, David brushes himself off, marries the woman, and gets on with life thinking that all is well. Enter Nathan. David's faithful to God friend and actually faithful to David friend. He once again has a word from the Lord to deliver. The story of his visit to the king is what 2 Samuel 12 is all about. Here's what we have in the first verses. I'm reading verses 1 through 7. This is 2 Samuel 12 verses 1 through 7. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, Nathan said, there were Two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. We've already seen Nathan give general encouragement, and then when God reveals more information, specific revelation of God's plan. Now we see Nathan giving a specific rebuke to the king who has broken the general laws which God had laid down years before. Adultery and murder are both part of the Big Ten. Specific correction is one of those touchy areas in our culture because we value personal freedom. We Americans believe that we can do whatever we want, behave however we want, without any interference from anyone. And by interference, more and more we mean not saying that anything's wrong or anything's right. Here's the problem. God has not allowed for liberty in all things. He has said certain things are sinful, and like it or not, his ideas of what's bad or immoral haven't changed over the centuries. His holy standards don't change with the times. This means that you and I, if we're followers of Jesus, cannot join the world in saying, we know better than those who came before us. This isn't sin anymore. This isn't wrong. Do whatever feels right to you. Anytime someone does what is right in their own eyes in the Bible, it is spoken of in a disparaging way. Only doing what is right in the eyes of God is praised. So here's the application. In the same way that we spur friends on to do good things, we can correct them when they choose the wrong path. The first two verses of Galatians chapter 6 ought to guide us. 
hear God on this matter. I'm reading Galatians 6, verses 1 and 2. It says this, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So we who are filled with the Spirit of God are to help each other. We're to help each other discern God's direction as we look for the good things that he's given us to do, and we're to help each other recognize when we've strayed from God's will so that we don't go farther and farther away from him and harden our hearts toward him. Do you have close Christian friends whom God is using to help you to follow him? Are you such a friend to another? If your answer is no to either of these, let me encourage you to pray for God's direction as you consider what you might do to make your friendships with believers more beneficial to you and to those who are closest to you. Remembering to encourage and rebuke in God's name and with gentleness, knowing that you're going to receive back and need back the very things that you pass along. I want us to pause for a moment and respond to God's word and ask him for his direction. Perhaps as you think on what you've heard, you could pray for God to show you a relationship that you need to pursue or strengthen, a relationship that will help you to follow after God and help you to be obedient to him. Ask him for what he wants for you and for your fellow believers. And then go out and live by the Spirit, gently rebuking and enthusiastically encouraging people to follow after God, your friends to follow after God. That's what our friendships in Christ are for, is to encourage following Jesus. So let's take a few moments and allow God to speak to us so that he can then go out and work through us wherever we go this week. Let's take a few moments. Help us this week to follow you. And God, I pray that you would send friends into our lives to be an encouragement toward those good things that you have for us to do. And friends who will show us where perhaps we're falling a little short. God, I pray that in both cases, your word would be spoken gently but directly. Help us to hear what you have for us to do and be obedient. God, I thank you for my friends here today who encourage me to follow after you. God, help me to be that one who says, let's go, let's follow Jesus together. God, send us out, compel us to go out into the harvest fields and to bring people to you. We thank you for your presence here today. We thank you that when we go from this place that your presence goes with us. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you have been encouraged and challenged by today's sermon. If you want to hear each week's message, be sure to subscribe to Friendly Words in your podcast app. May God bless you as you follow Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit.